The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Our speaker today, Neil McFarquhar, is the UN Bureau Chief of the New York Times. Prior to his current position, he was based in Cairo for five years as the Times Middle East correspondent. Tonight he will be speaking on his new book, Media Relations Department of Hezbollah Wishes You a Happy Birthday. The book is unique in that it weaves together the author's experiences of growing up in Libya with his adult years spent in the Middle East as a correspondent. And as a result, he is able to fill in the missing pieces between the outside image of the Middle East, which we commonly see portrayed as being overwhelmed with conflict, and what he calls the much more engaging internal reality of the Middle East that is filled, that is filled with warmth and humanity. Thus, this engrossing book provides a perspective of the Middle East that we rarely are exposed to through media in the US. It is with great pleasure that I welcome and introduce Neil McFarquhar. Good evening, and thank you all for turning out on a rainy night. Um, you know, when, you, when people find out that you're the, the Middle East correspondent for the New York Times, the first response is, I have a question for you. And uh, I always brace for it because it's usually, when is there going to be peace in the Middle East? And you don't get any great, gain any credibility by predicting that. Um, but I was uh, about in the fourth year of my tenure um, as the Middle East uh, bureau chief and correspondent when I was on vacation in San Francisco and a woman came up to me at a dinner party and she said, I've got a question for you. So I was bracing myself and she said, aren't there any normal people in the Middle East? People like you and me? Or at least people we could relate to? And I said, yeah, sure, all kinds. What have you been reading? And she said, the New York Times. Um, <laughs> So I kind of thought about it for a little while, and I realized that you know my tenure there had more or less coincided with you know a, a, a sea of violence, starting with the 9/11 attacks and proceeding through the invasion of Iraq um, and various other you know, uprising, not uprising exactly, but explosions in Saudi Arabia. And um, I thought you know there's just such a gap between the perception and the reality because of course I, I had to write about those events because they were sort of the, the the main news events, but my life. Um, unrolled at a, at a, in a completely different world as well because there were a lot of people that I knew and appreciated. And I had sort of experienced that gap early on in my life because I first moved to um, Libya as a three-year-old where my father was a chemical engineer. And um, we lived in a town that was basically wholly owned by um, the oil company, and it was Esso, which was the precursor to Exxon, and they sort of fenced off 11 square miles uh, next to the Mediterranean and called it theirs, and the, and the Libyans had to be out by um, 5 o'clock, and, um, you know, for us kids, we didn't really notice the difference. We went to Esso Elementary School, and, um, you know, every afternoon we uh, ran down to the beach and we sailed and swam in the Mediterranean, and um, it was a little bit like you know growing up in Club Med, or as I used to call it, Texas uh, on the Mediterranean. Um, but the mark of our isolation, um, I think the strongest mark of our isolation came on September 1st, 1969, because every day before I went to school, I would sit down and eat cornflakes with my father, and he would flip on the BBC World Service on the radio and listen to the headlines. And the headline that day was, um, you know, there's been a coup in Libya, and Major Muammar al Gaddafi has seized control of the government. We kind of stare at each other, really. And there was no hint in the town at all that the government of the country where we were living had just changed. So um, when I went back there as a correspondent, um, particularly for the Times, um, I was determined to try and make a difference that time and just sort of enmesh myself more in the fabric of the society. Um, and as luck would have it, um, the first assignment I got when I showed up in the Middle East, I showed it up in January, and two weeks later I was on my way to Libya because the, the Lockerbie uh, bomber who had been acquitted was on his way home. And, you know, so I was thrilled because I'd always wanted to go back to my childhood home. Um, so, you know, I showed up in Libya, and it was a very different Libya than the one I had left because, 
by now it had been living under, um, by then it had been living, you know, more than 30 years, and they just passed the 40-year mark of Gaddafi's rule. And he, he um, you know, he's a very, um, you know, he changes his mind a lot. He's a Mercurial leader. And uh, the problem that was sort of unrolling while I was there is nobody could figure out what year it was because he kept changing the date. Um, and most Muslims, um, the Muslim calendar is dated from the year that uh, Muhammad emigrated from uh, Mecca to Medina to sort of found, really gathered his, his um, followers together to sort of make the religion work. And Qaddafi decided that he didn't want it that way. He was going to change it to um, the year that Muhammad died, and that would be preferable. And then a couple of years later, he said, no, you know, it'd be better to count from the year that Muhammad was born. So there were like, you know, it, was, it had been 1429, and then it switched to 1431, and then suddenly it was 1369. And, you know, the event organizers just kind of threw up their hands and um, put the, the, the Western date in parentheses next to whatever... Uh, event they were trying to organize, and ordinary people just kind of threw up their hands. And um, Qaddafi has this thing, he, his conceit is that he doesn't actually rule the country, that it, you know, he's the guide to the revolution, but that the Libyan people themselves run everything. Um, you know, and it, it, it doesn't extend to the oil business or anything important, but on sort of social matters, whenever he has an idea, he convenes popular committees, and it's usually twice a year or so, and the entire country is required to attend them. So. Um, and there's, you know, there's no getting around it. So the news that I was, I had gone for was largely over, but I couldn't travel anywhere because the airline shut down and all the travel agencies shut down and the food stores shut down and everything shuts down and everybody has to go to these popular committee meetings. And if you don't go, you know, you may not be allowed to travel outside the country or you, you can get in trouble. So I sort of thought this was going to be terrible, on him, but I resigned myself to the inevitable and I wandered down Revolution Street to where one was unrolling in a movie theater about this size. And it turned out to be great because it was the one place where Libyans were allowed to freely express their opinion. And so they talked about all the problems they were having. And they, occasionally, they, you know, Qaddafi at one point had decided that um, he wanted to ban elementary schools, that mothers should all teach their children at home. And of course, the mothers, you know, rose up in arms at these popular committee meetings and they shot the idea down. But the day I was there, they were talking about this date business and why they couldn't be like every other Muslim country. And that's what one woman stood up and she said, you know, why? Do, you know, why does every other Muslim country do it one way and we do it differently? Can't we just be normal? And um, you know, I didn't realize that at the time what an important question that is because it's one that resonates around the Middle East about you know, why they aren't normal and why they seem to be out of step with history and out of step with the rest of the world. And um, you know, I tried to devote as much time as I could to reporting on what the normal was and what day-to-day -day life was like because I thought that would illustrate what, you know, they are struggling with. And sometimes it was, you know, a great deal of fun. One of my all-time favorites was in Iran. And um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an actually easier country to report in than you, than you think. But I was in Iran one year and I turned on the, the news on the weekend and um, found out that a... Um, a provincial cleric had issued a fatwa against dogs, and he said that owning dogs, you know, was a sin. And it, it is true that in the Muslim faith, um, most dogs, except for sort of guard dogs and sheep dogs, are considered ritually unclean. Um, and apparently, in Iran, they had tried, you know, because they want to build a perfect Muslim society, they had tried ever since the revolution in 1979 to get rid of dogs. So he had given this sermon, this provincial cleric, and he had said, you know, the people who died on the battlefield in the Iran-Iraq war were particularly lucky because they didn't live to see women wearing hats and men carrying dogs. And um, because some women, instead of wearing the traditional veil, had started wearing baseball caps. Um, so, I, you know, I started asking questions about this, and it turned out that because they had um, banned dogs, and, you know, I mean, I was interested in the topic, first of all, because just in fact was in general, people in the West tend to um, associate them with a death sentence because the one that Ayatollah Khomeini um, made against Salman Rushdie in 1989 is the one that is the most famous. And so I kind of wanted to find an example to show that it's something that enters into people's day-to-day -day lives, and I thought the dog one was, was a perfect example of that, because it turns out that they, as I said, they roll them out every two years or so. And so I met this woman, and she had had a big black poodle, and um, she'd taken it out for a walk one day, and it was about from me to where that food table is, and, and along came two men on a motorcycle and kidnapped it, because it turns out that there's a premium on dogs. 
Um, and so, you know, she had gone down to the Animal Bazaar. There's a whole section of the Tehran Bazaar that's devoted to animals, and she found it for sale. So I thought, well, I'll go to um, the <coughs> uh, Animal Bazaar and see what happens. And, um, you know, I don't know if this, this neighborhood in Chicago still has the reputation for being sort of a center for drugs anymore or not. I haven't been here for a while, but it was like Thompson Square Park in New York where, you know, you walk the park and people are offering you things. And I'd walk along and they saw I was a Western and they'd say, got a dog, you want a dog? Um, or one guy came right up to my ear and he whispered and he said, I got a German Shepherd, you want a German Shepherd? Um, and one of the people I ran into at the bazaar was sort of a municipal dog catcher. Um, and so I started interviewing him about you know, what his work was like. He said, no, 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 we don't ban dogs. You're allowed to have it as long as you're, um, you know, you have a permit and the shots are in order. It's fine. Um, and the, a man in the crowd who heard him explaining this to me said, you're a liar. You took my dog away for no reason. And he started to strangle the guy. And so the police had to intervene. And in the melee, somebody came up and whispered to me and he said, he said, there's no laws in Iran for the way they take away dogs just like people. And, you know, I just thought, wow, you know, it's just a, it's a great way to show how the society really works and the problems people have. And um, it was also sort of a telling example because owning dogs was sort of a subtle form of rebellion, the way people sort of fought the system. It's like, well, the government of the mullahs doesn't, doesn't like dogs and we don't like the government, so we're going to own a dog just to sort of show them that we don't like them. Um, but, you know, so <clears throat> those kind of stories I thought were great in illuminating um, how life unrolls in the Middle East, but unfortunately, a lot of the times I was caught up in, in, in um, you know, war and the, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, but so at one point at, in 2004, my editors came to me and they said, you know, we know your four-year tenure is up, but um, we'd really like you to stay another year. You know, if you do stay another year, is there a special project you would like to do? Um, and I said yes, because at that point, the United States had started making sort of a policy of... Um, you know, increasing democracy in the region. And I thought, well, you know, we've heard this policy from the outside, but what's, it, what's happening on the inside? And so they gave me more or less a year to go to um, a bunch of countries and just sort of find one or two democracy or, you know, social activists in each country and use that to illustrate how the, how the battle for change was, was coming along or the struggle for change was coming along. Um, and, you know, I, my um, after four years of writing about so much violence, I was sort of pessimistic about the region a little bit, the future, and I was especially appreciative because the people I met on this odyssey really sort of restored my faith in the region that there were people in the Middle East that were working for change and they were really committed to it, and you know it really didn't matter what the outside world did; they were going to they were going to stick to it. Um, and and I think that 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 they those kind of people are incredibly brave, and they often get lost. Uh, you know, amidst the daily stories about um, the war in Iraq, et cetera. Um, but basically, I came away with, with, with six points, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm just going to sort of give those examples of, of, the, of the things that people are struggling against. And the first one is, you know, the grip of the secret police, because they just sort of stifle any kind of activity, political, social, or otherwise, in those countries because they are so powerful. Um, and the second one is that it's difficult to sort of fight the secret police or any kind of, um, you know, go government action because even if the laws are on the books allowing you to do it, what's written on the books and what's practiced in terms of the law are not necessarily one and the same thing because the governments just kind of tend to override the law if they don't like it. Um, and they, they, you know, and the, the third problem would be the lack of, of civil rights in terms of the ability to organize because when people see problems and they want to get together and, and you know, build civil society and affect change, they can't because the, the main right they're missing is you know, the, the, the right to assembly and the right to free speech. And so it's difficult to sort of pull together a movement that's going to oppose the government or, or push for social change. Um, and, and, and the fourth issue is, is the one group that has sort of managed to do that because they don't need to uh, organize in the public space, they can organize in the mosques, is, is sort of the Islamic parties. And, and there's sort of a question hanging over them of whether they're really committed to, you know, sort of universal rights and, and, and civil rights for the whole society. Um, and then, um, you know, the other problem in the region is that the governments they're fighting against tend to be minority governments. Um, you know, it's either one family, one tribe, one military clique, 
um, or, or a religious minority that runs all those countries, and so they have such a large stake in survival that they, they, they don't really want anyone to question them. And um, people were hoping that you know, with the generational change, as, as the older rulers who were around in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and died out, and their sons took over, that this would be, you know, that, that, that you know, they were partially Western educated, or they'd spent time outside, and they were certainly more sophisticated than their fathers were, that they would, you know, inherently bring change, and that has not proved to be um, the case. And the reason these six points are important is because um, you know, if you want to fight extremism and you want those societies um, to, to be more open, you have to allow these kind of rights to flourish or you have to at least get them started. And that's, you know, the stronger way than, than just trying to tell people that their religion is wrong because, um, you know, you're trying to impose that from outside and you want the, the movements to sort of come from inside the country themselves so they'll have sort of roots and, and, and be strong. And um, I can't get over, I, I mean, I can't, um, exaggerate the role of the secret police in, in stopping that kind of activity. And, you know, the word for the secret police in Arabic is mukhabarat, and it's one of the first words that um, anybody um, who moves there, even foreigners, learn because you inevitably have a run-in with them. And my, um, my run-in with the mukhabarat came fairly early in my tenure there in 2001. I was actually, I was at Muhammad Atta's um, grade school, and as many of you remember, he was sort of the evil genius behind the 9-11 attacks, and so I was out looking for his teachers, um, and uh, I'd finished the interview, and I was standing across the street from the, the, the school, and I was waiting for my driver to show up, and I was standing in front of the headquarters of the secret police, and I was just loitering a little too long for their comfort, so they came and they come in here, what are you doing, who are you? So I explained, and they made the phone calls to the Ministry of Information and, you know, checked my credentials, and sure enough, I was bona fide, and they said, okay, you can go. So I went and stood outside, and my driver still didn't come, and they opened the door again and said, you know what, that wasn't long enough, come back in. So they came back in, and they sort of shunted me from office to office for about an hour, and finally I walked into an office of um, a major, and he had... 11 diplomas from the FBI on the wall behind him. And one was for sharpshooting, I remember, and one was for English, and one was for interrogation. And so he said, sit down. And I said, is this an interrogation? And he said, no, it's tea. Um, and so he, he served me tea, and we talked for about an hour about, you know, he, he was responsible for the 5,000 Americans who live in Egypt for, you know, his point of view is he was responsible for their safety and security, and he wanted to know what I thought of the country, etc. So we had a fine, friendly conversation, and he let me go. Um, but after that, I was always, he always made sure that I knew that he was watching. Um, and we would do stuff, especially anything involving the Muslim Brotherhood, he was on to me immediately. And um, I had heard that um, there were more sermons, anti-American sermons were cropping up more and more in the mosques, and they were being recorded and distributed. So I tried to go out and buy some, and of course nobody would sell me anything. Um, so I went out with one of my Egyptian staffers, and she bought a few tapes, and so we were listening to them, and the phone rings in the office, and you know, it's the major, and he's like, what's on the tapes? <laughs> and uh, Abir Alam, who was the Egyptian reporter, <laughs> God bless her, she said, go buy your own. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and it, I don't want to make it seem like it was, you know, it, it, was, it was nervous for us, but obviously for the Egyptians it was nerve-wracking in a much, you know, larger way because they could interfere in any aspect of their lives. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like it was always a one-way street. Sometimes it worked to our advantage. We were in a little Egyptian village, and we were trying to interview um, sort of a high-powered, uh, the, the family of, a, of, of the military um, planner for al-Qaeda had been killed in Afghanistan, and we were out looking for his family to get a reaction. And um, the father said no, you know, he wouldn't talk to us. And then suddenly somebody materialized who was, said he was the brother, and he gets out of a car with no license plate, and there's three guys with him, and they all have biceps like the size of my thigh. And he's like, we'll talk to you, um, but we have to get permission from the secret police. So we're like, okay, okay. So we go, and they take us to like this darkened factory with a chain link fence around. So this is secret police, we'll go inside and we'll get permission. And I, you know, a beer was with me again. I said, call the major, and thank God he answered on the first ring, which he usually didn't do. And he, we said, where's the secret police? you know, headquarters in this town, and he described it, and we knew we weren't there, and so we hightailed it out of there. Um, so, you know, it, it, it could be an advantage to know somebody in it, but, um, you know, it, it, it usually worked to people's detriment. And, and the example that I use in the book is a, is a young Jordanian poet. Um, he's about 35 now, and he is um, a, a civic engineer. He 
supervises construction projects, but he's always used poetry as a sort of political message since he was in college. He, they called him the poet of the University of Jordan. He's, you know, stocky guy, bald head. And um, he was hauled in um, uh, by, his name is Samir Al-Qadah, and he was hauled in by the secret police maybe 20 times when he was in, in Jordan. And then, um, but he was very in demand. It's sort of funny because it, we don't think of it that way, but like the Association of Dentists in, in Jordan or the Association of Doctors, they'll often invite a poet to speak at one of their gatherings because they just, even if it's a political speech, they love hearing it in, in beautiful language. Um, and so he gave a speech in, in 1996 in his local town in which he compared Arab rulers um, to highwaymen, basically. And he said that the way consensus is built in our country is, is the leader gives a speech and everybody claps. And that's, what, that's freedom of expression in our country when you're allowed to clap um, for the ruler's speech. Well, um, he was charged with slander. And um, it's a great word in Arabic. It's italat lisan, which is the lengthening of the tongue. Um, and they threw him in jail for a year, um, just for that one poem. And um, you know, he um, he said it's very hard this kind of struggle because you don't want to sit at home and just accept to live under these systems, you know. And, and it, my friends who live in Jordan, they sort of you can't talk to them about the Mukhabarat in public. They always call them the friends. The friends said this. The friends are doing that. Um, and, I, and I have a, an academic friend that lives there, and he calls it an inconspicuous police state, because you don't feel it. You know, in, in countries like under Saddam's Iraq or in Syria, you really kind of feel a tension um, after you spend a little bit of time there. And in Jordan, you don't feel it exactly, but it's there, because if you want to be an ambassador, if you want to be a newspaper editor, if you want to be a university professor, your file has to go to the Mukhabarat first for approval, and they sort of run the country that way. And, um, you know, it is just in every Arab country, it is a powerful, ubiquitous institution that the leaders who, um, you know, they don't have a popular mandate and their answer for strengthening things is to make sure that the secret police are stronger all the time. And, you know, it, 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 they are a law unto themselves. I mean, the, the, the most amazing example in Jordan was the head of the secret police was a chain smoker. And when he was on a royal Jordanian flight from, say, London to back to Amman, he would smoke. And you know, you're not allowed to smoke on any airplanes in the world practically anymore. And people would complain, and the airline would say, you know, we'll put you on another flight if you want to, but he's the head of the secret police, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and you know, that is the problem in a lot of those Middle Eastern countries, is that there's laws on the books, but the laws are not applied equally. Um, and the example that I use in the book for this is um, Morocco. And, the, and the, the Article 23 of the uh, Moroccan Constitution um, says the king's person is inviolable and sacred. Um, and um, that's, it's one sentence, and that's all it is. And that means that anybody who says uh, anything critical of the king is considered um, violating the sacred values of Morocco. And people run into it all the time. I mean, a, a journalist, for example, when I was there at one point, had written an article saying the king was going to sell one of his palaces um, to turn it into a luxury hotel. And the um, prosecution, the government prosecuted him successfully, they brought a chunk of the palace in, and they said, you know, this belongs to the king, and uh, the king is sacred, and by extension, anything the king owns is sacred, and so he was violating the sacred values of Morocco, and the, the prosecution won the case. Um, but the man who um, had the most tortured example of that was a man named Ahmed Marzouki that um, I met, and um, he had been a young army recruit in 1970 when um, he was loaded onto a truck with a bunch of other young conscripts, and they were told we're going on a live fire exercise and um, just follow orders. And they came to a golf course and were told, you know, just open fire on the people on the golf course. And they were opening fire on, you know, the cabinet and the king's best friends and hoping to kill the king, is what the officers had in mind. Um, so the officers who led it, it was unsuccessful, um, were executed live by firing squad on television, and the junior guys like Ahmed um, were sentenced to five years in jail each. And then while their court case was in train, there was a second uh, attempt to assassinate the king in, in 1972. They tried to shoot down his plane, and so the king just said, I'm going to make an example out of the first group, and so he had a um, prison built in the desert called Tazmamart, and he just sort of threw um, 58 conscripts or you know sort of junior officers into it who'd taken apart in the first group and threw away the key, 
And, um, you know, Ahmed, he calls it, you know, I lived an eternal night. And the stories are just horrific because basically when they first got there, there were 58 men and they got four loaves of bread every day and that's what they had for food. They, you know, they had to divide um, four loaves of food between 58 men and there was no medical care. One guy had some sort of debilitating disease that took him 11 years to die and he never saw a doctor in all those 11 years. And, um, you know, they, they finally got word to their families after the guards became sympathetic enough, but the families couldn't do anything because the government just denied that, that it existed. Um, and then their break came when the daughter of one of the men in the prison came in among the top ten students in the high school completion exams in Morocco, and the king meets the top ten students, and at the end of the session with the king, um, he said, is there anything I can do for you? And one, the girl said, when are you going to let my father out of, of Tazmamar? And, you know, the king turns um, casually to one of his aides and he said, is anybody still alive in Tuzmamar? And um, even with that, that started an international campaign. And even with that, it took another two years um, to, get them, to get them out of jail. And, you know, Ahmed, he's, he's, he, I've never met Nelson Mandela, but he comes the closest to any figure that I've ever met that's like that because he's just had this horrible experience of, you know, 19 years of his life in prison for for no reason, and he said, I never understood sort of the capricious nature of power until you know I was thrown into jail like that and had no recourse to get out. And so now he spends all his life you know, campaigning for you know, a greater separation of powers, an independent judiciary, police supervision, and you know, public, um, public rights of free speech and things like that. Um, but it's, it, it's difficult for him to, to, to make any headway um, because that right to organize just doesn't exist almost anywhere in the Arab world. And um, the, where, the, the place that I ran into this, you know, the, the, was the most striking was Saudi Arabia because, you know, the reputation of Saudi Arabia abroad is kind of like oil and camels, and, and, and since 9-11 it's kind of oil, um, camels, and extremists. Um, but there was an incredibly educated, erudite, um, population in Saudi Arabia that makes it an absolute joy to spend time and work in that country. Just they're incredible. They're very hospitable and welcoming. But um, so I spent a lot of time with them, and I met two people in particular um, who were kind of questioning the system in Saudi Arabia and got into trouble for doing it. And they worked totally independently. They didn't know each other, but they had reached very similar conclusions. And was one was a, a theologian named Hassan Malaki, and he was like he grew up very poor in the in the south of the country. You know, walked ten kilometers to school every day, and he was the first member of his family to to go to university. And when he got to university, he was expecting, you know, this great intellectual experience and he was going to be able to question everything. And he went to a, a religious university. Instead, he found, like, this rigid doctrinaire um, curriculum where, you know, they were lectured about what Muhammad um, wore and how they should wear the same thing. You know, they should wear a short gown and um, trim their beard in a specific way because that's the way Muhammad did it. And any attempts to question, um, you know, the theology was just unacceptable. And so, you know, he started researching into why that was, and, and his sort of conclusion was that Islam, as it is practiced in Saudi Arabia, is all about the sort of political, historical, military version of Islam, and it has very little to do with the spiritual um, side of it. And, um, you know, he started looking around, and he decided that, that the, the source of that was the Umayyad dynasty, which is sort of like the first pan-Arab dynasty that ruled from Damascus from 1661 to, to 750. And they were the ones that had come up with a formula that if a ruler is rightly guided by Islam, then the people and the population have no right to question them. Um, and they had sort of passed that down through the generations, and, and the sort of spiritual godfather of the of the Wahhabi sect that is prevalent um, in Saudi Arabia is a 13th century theologian named Ibn Taymiyyah, and he sort of held the, um, the Umayyads up as, as the example, and, 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 the, the, and, the, and the Saudis sort of took that example, and they basically rule along the same system that, you know, that as long as the El Saud dynasty is following Islam, then the population has no right to, to question the way um, the country is governed. And, you know, he had reached, um, Hassan had reached the conclusion, he said, you know, if we had real Islam, the way, you know, the Quran lays it out, there would be no, you know, aggressive jihad, there would be no death to converts, and, and you would be allowed to question everything, because that's the way, um, you know, the book is structured. 
And, and you know, and the, the other person that I met that, that had reached this conclusion was, a, was an education professor, a woman named um, Fauzia al -Bakr. And Fauzia is one of the strongest, most outspoken, most admirable women I, I met in, in, in my time in the region. And just um, as a mark of what she did, she had been home for three days. She back in Saudi Arabia for three, year, three days after being away for almost a decade in, in 1990. And this was right after the invasion of um, Kuwait by Iraq. And you know the Iraqi army was sitting on the border, and nobody knew whether they were going to come over or not. And women don't have the right to drive in Saudi Arabia. And so the women were saying, you know, we really need the right to drive. It's that we're in the middle of a war, and if we need to flee with our children, we know, have to know that we have to get into a car and go. Um, and so a group of about 47 women drove on the freeways of Riyadh. And Riyadh is an incredible city because it's sort of, it was built and designed by Americans. So it looks like, you know, Arizona, but the mindset is sort of from an earlier time. Um, and so the, the women drove and they were, you know, the, the sort of westernized Saudis were thrilled and they thought this was the beginning of, you know, they galvanized the movement. And I think the... Um, the protest movement, and this was going to be the first, you know, step toward real change in the kingdom. And they drove on like a third, a Wednesday or Tuesday, I don't quite remember. Um, and on Friday, you know, the, the every two-bit mosque preacher in that country, um, every imam around just sort of laid into them and said they were whores and that they had not been brought up in Islamic households and it was a shame and they should be fired and divorced. And, um, you know, Fauzia showed up at work the next day uh, or the, on that Sunday and, uh, you know, her name tag, her name had been torn off her door and Kafra was written there, which means infidel. And they took away her passport and she lost her job for 18 months. And, you know, she said, if I had, if you had told me 15 years ago that my taking part in that demonstration would a, you know, make sure that I could never serve on a panel or never be promoted, and b, that I still wouldn't have the right to drive, I just never would have believed you. But you know, despite that struggle, she continued to believe that you know it was her right and her duty to try and overturn those laws. And she focused a lot on the amount of you know religion in the schools. She just sort of said there's much too much religion in the curriculum and she was trying to change that. Um, but just on the day-to-day -day thing, it was just, it was interesting because um, I, just how these kind of things work, I needed to take a picture of her because we were, I was writing a big story about her in the newspaper and we hadn't taken her picture. So I called her up and I said, can I, I've got the photographer with me, can I come over now and take the picture? She's like, sure, sure, no problem. And we go over there and by the time we got over there, she kind of thought about the consequences. And you know, there's a there's a, a law in Saudi Arabia called Khurwa where an unmarried man and an un I mean a, a man and woman who are not married cannot be in the same enclosed space together. And she suddenly realized, you know, she'd sort of been careful to have her husband around, but he wasn't there when I wanted to take the picture. And um, she wasn't sure how to deal with that with taking the picture because she didn't want to take the veil off inside the house because um, then she would be accused, you know, of, of having been unveiled in front of someone who was not her husband and, um, or she was not related to, um, but she didn't want to wear the veil inside the house because it would look weird that she was doing it. So she, finally she agreed um, to be t photographed in the street and um, she took along her six-year-old son because in the eyes of the religious police, her six-year-old son could be her guardian. Um, and, you know, it lasted about 15 minutes for the photography session, and then she just said, you know, I, I just can't do this anymore, I have to go inside. And at first I thought she was being overly cautious, and then I met some of the women who had had run-ins with the religious police, and I realized that, that, that she was um, being incredibly brave. And her conclusion on all this stuff was that, you know, they keep us busy with this little trivial stuff, you know, like how we're dressed around other men or things like that, so we don't ask the big questions about who's ruling the country. And um, in all or most of the Arab world, who's ruling the country is either one family, one sect, or one sort of military clique. And you know they gain so much from that power, and just in, I mean in terms of wealth and power, that they are loath to give it up. I mean the El Sals are the biggest example because you know it used to be when. Um, King Abdulaziz unified the kingdom in 1932. It was sort of a small group, and they kind of he ran it like a household. You know, he kept the treasury in the trunk under his bed, and he gave people money. And you know, to a certain extent, the the Saudis are still trying to run it that way. But it's a country of 27 million people, um, and it just isn't run terribly well. But you know, they control um, a quarter of the world's oil um, reserves, and then no one knows how much money the, the family siphons off. So they're not about to give that up with without a struggle. And um, 
you know, in Syria, it's an Alawite minority regime. It's a it's sort of offshoot. Um, some people say they're legitimate Muslims. Some people don't. Um, but it's definitely, you know, the Sunni rule. What used to be the Sunni ruling class sort of considered the Alawites, you know, good good material for servants and not much else. And so the Alawites are not about to um, secede power out of fear of what will happen to them. And it's, you know, they've been in power for so long, they, they changed the, the constitution um, so that the son could inherit from the father. And Bashar was only 34, and the constitution said you had to be 40 to be president. So they just said, oh, we'll change the constitution, and the new age is required to be president, and is, lo and behold, 34. Um, so um, in every one of these, th these um, these countries, it's impossible to change. You know, Libya and Egypt are sort of seem to be slouching toward some sort of dynastic rule, although we don't know yet. And even when kings or um, or others come in that say they want to change it, I mean, King Hamad in Bahrain, for example, came in and said, "I'm going to build a deep democracy, and we're going to change everything here. We're going to have a new constitution that gives much more power to the people." And then there was just such aggressive criticism of the way the government is run, is that he that he changed his mind. Um, and he, and he um, you know, did a new constitution all on his own without consulting the people as he had promised he would. And I, you know, I, I spent time in that country with the sort of first person to open a website and a blog about Bahrain. Um, uh, and um, Ali, the, the guy who ran this, um, said he had this bitter joke. And he said, in the Middle East, a constitutional monarchy means the monarch writes the constitution. And um, he was, um, you know, he was sort of hoping that his online protest was going to sort of galvanize people to bring change, and it didn't. And he said, basically, the, it has come down to, um, you know, you can say what you want to, and we're going to do what we want to. And it was a, it was a standoff in that way. And so, you know, people wonder if, with the political opposition has been so ineffective for so many years in the Middle East, whether the online version is going to change that. And there have been a few indications along the way that that it might work. Um, there was a woman in Egypt who was trying to express solidarity with a bunch of textile workers who were protesting, and so she said, you know, on April sixth. Um, 2007 or 2008, nobody should go to work. And, um, you know, the government completely freaked out because the, they, they, she got like 76,000 friends on Facebook within a matter of a very short time. And so they were sure that this was a mass protest movement. So they ordered everybody to go to work. And nothing makes Egyptians quite as ornery as the government telling them to do something. So they, you know, they stayed away in huge numbers, also out of fear because there were so many policemen and riot police on the streets that they were really worried about what was going to happen. So it was considered this great success, and everybody was predicting that you know, Facebook was the, was the wave of the political future. And then she tried it the next year, and it didn't work. And you know, we've seen more and more examples of that in all countries across the region that you, know, you see it with Al Jazeera, too. And I happen to be a great admirer of Al Jazeera. It has a terrible reputation in this country. But um, as a reporter working in the region, they just unearthed an incredible number of dissident voices. And you know, if they had a program where Colonel Gaddafi was making some claim about Libya, then they would bring someone on, you know, someone from the opposition who'd been in London or some, you know, working in obscurity, and you suddenly had a voice um, from the other side. Um, but I think people, um, you know, that has been going on for almost a decade now, and um, it, it has been longer than a decade, but a decade since you know Al Jazeera gained prominence. And you know, there's sort of frustration that that it isn't working, um, you know, and, and that civil society isn't growing this way. That it's just sort of voices out there making noise, and it, and it doesn't mean anything. And you know, one of the problems that, is that the governments fight it because they say, well, if we open everything up, then you're going to get you know the Islamic tsunami, and we're the we're the only dike between you and, and and Muslim radicalism. And it is a dilemma in the Middle East about what to do about the Islamic party, because they are very well organized. They're organized through um, the, the mosque. And they also, I mean, it is a legitimate political movement, because um, people are, do believe they are, um, have strong faith, um, and they want to see their religion reflected in their society and um, in their politics. So there's going to have to be some accommodation made um, to sort of, you can't have reform without having some kind of accommodation to those Muslim political groups. And sort of the grandfather of them all is the Muslim Brotherhood, which was founded by an elementary school teacher in Egypt in 1928. And he basically had three main points. And that was that you know the Quran has all um, 
the prescriptions that you need for a political and a social system that you know Muslims have fallen on hard times and been colonized because they got away from the Quran and as soon as they get back to it they will regain their former glory and that there's always going to be people working against them um, and the more radical parties that have come along since said they're too accommodating because the basic philosophy of the Muslim Brotherhood is we can wait it out because we have a superior system and everyone will come to us eventually but you know the worry is because there's been a few examples where they've started to exert power is that you know they're going to do it by force and they're never terribly reassuring when you talk to them I'm, I, in the book I spend a lot of time with a Muslim brother parliamentarian and, you know I, from Alexandria in Egypt and I asked him well you know are you going to enforce Islamic law and he said well no but everyone will eventually recognize that it's superior and they'll want it and, and you say, well, are you going to force women to wear the veil? And he said, no, but, you know, all the women will eventually recognize it's superior and they will want it. And, you know, are you going to ban alcohol, in, you know, in, in areas? And you say, well, I know the tourists want it, but eventually all the Muslims will realize that drinking alcohol is a bad idea and they'll want it banned. And so they make everybody, you know, edgy in that way. And I think in talking to the people, I always found that they wanted the Islamic parties because when we talk about reform, you know, we think of that they're going to have a system like ours. But when they talk about reform, their main concern is sort of corruption and malfeasance. And they want, you know, someone, a government that's not going to steal from them. And they want, you know, a certain amount of economic security. And they want an amount of a personal security. You know, they won't want to be afraid of the knock of the secret police in the middle of the night. And so they sort of think that their best chance of getting that is with, um, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but I think, and there are others that believe that if you allow, you know, civil society to expand and, and, you, and you foster that growth, then you're going to get, um, you know, more alternatives than just the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. And, um, you know, how does the U.S. go about that? And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, you know, how do people react to you as an American? What do they think of America? What do they think of American values? And um, I must say that, I mean, having lived in the region for so many years, uh, you know, I am always amazed by just how generous, welcoming, and just that sense of hospitality. They just do not hold what the government, what the American government does against me. Um, and the, the one exception to that was probably in 2003. And, um, you know, obviously my colleagues in Iraq bore the brunt of it, I, and I think 89 journalists have been killed since the beginning of the Iraq war. But, you know, I was never that one year because every time they turned on the TV, they'd see American tanks rolling across Iraq or you know American soldiers battering down the doors, um, and so they were sort of mad at Americans for most of 2003. And I sensed it, but I always wanted to know what the reaction was, so I never really wanted to lie. You know, some people say I'm Swiss, I'm Brazilian, I'm whatever. Um, you know, that 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 doesn't have any political. Um, any dog in that fight, as it were, and um, but I'd always say, well, I'm from New York, because then it would, you know, take them sort of ten more seconds to figure out that was American, and I could have sort of ten more seconds of pleasant conversation. Um, and they were never really rude. They were just sort of, you know, Egyptians love to banter with you, and people in that part of the world, you know, they just they ask you about your life, your wife, your kids, and they would just stop, and they would just sort of, you know, do whatever transaction was at hand. Um, and there were a few nasty incidents. Some of, you know, I was in Jeddah and Saudi Arabia, and. and Someone threw a full can of, of, of Pepsi at me. It, you know, bounced away harmlessly. But anyway, it was a little bit, you know, sort of unsettling because you never quite knew what the reaction might be. Um, my favorite reaction, though, was I broke a tooth in Jeddah, and it was late at night, and it snapped off, and so I had to go to a dentist the first thing in the morning. So I go into this dental clinic, and the first dentist that was available was a Syrian, and I said you know, where are you from? And he said, Aleppo. And I said, where'd you study dentistry? And he said, the University of Aleppo. And I said, where'd you go after that? And he said, no, I didn't go anywhere after that. And I was, you know, sort of trying to rack my brain thinking, how good is the dentistry school at the University of Aleppo? Um, and he's fiddling with his instruments and, uh, you know, he's testing his jabbers and his pokers. He says, why? Where are you from? And, and I said, New York. And he said, American, and he's starting to drill. That's not a very popular thing to be. Open wide. <laughs> um, but he did a fantastic job, and it's still in there. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there is some admiration for the United States, but people don't want to be dictated as to, you know, what kind of government they should have. And uh, Secretary of State um, Rice gave a famous speech in Cairo in 2005, and she said, you know, for 60 years we've pursued stability and um, at the expense of democracy and achieved neither, but it was a very sort of lukewarm policy and it, and it, and it didn't go anywhere. And I think um, 
you know, the emphasis on democracy kind of failed because people identify um, Iraq with democracy, and they were told that, you know, this is the democracy enterprise, the American invasion of Iraq. And so, you know, they don't, we kind of take our system for granted, and we know how democracy is supposed to work, but if you haven't lived with it and you're told, well, democracy is coming to Iraq, and then the next thing you know, you know, 100,000 people are, are dead, um, you think, well, I don't want democracy. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that the United States has to um, do a better job. There's basically three things that they do a better job of. And one is, um, is talking to people in their own vocabulary. And sort of, you know, they're uneasy about the idea of democracy. They think it's a Western concept that's, that's being foisted upon them. And freedom, they also, you know, freedom, to a certain extent, they just associate with a lack of values in, in the West. And, you know, it's freedom to do whatever the hell you want. Um, and so... Um, you know, but there there are concepts that exist within Islam and within their culture that translate into those you know into opening up the political system. There, you know, the concept of justice is very strong, and um, the concept of dignity is very strong. So you know, you have to use a vocabulary in talking to them that they feel like you know they're part of that and they want to have a hand in, in constructing it. Um, and the second thing is, I think you need to support all agents of change, no matter who they are. Um, sometimes, you know, you look at the Syrian, you know, there's some incredibly brave people in Syria working for human rights um, who get thrown in jail. And the United States government does a very poor job about speaking out in support of them because we don't really think Syria, you know, it, you, they, they sort of, the policy on Syria is a little bit undecided. And I think whether you think the agents of change are working in your interests or not, Ultimately, they, they're working to better their societies, and so they need some kind of support. They don't need an endorsement, because an endorsement would actually undermine them at the moment, because American credibility is so low that if you say, you know, I think Joe is doing a great job, and he's going to bring democracy to your country, they're going to say, forget about Joe. You know, he is a, an agent of a foreign power. Um, but you do need to know that those values you matter, that, you know, the fact that, that, that you know, Ahmed al bunni in Syria is working to make sure that there's freedom of speech in Syria. You say that freedom of speech is an important value. And, you know, the Egyptian government, uh, there was a guy, everyone says, oh, no one cares about politics, they're tired of it. Um, but Ayman Noor was a, ran for president in Egypt, and he managed to get 7% of the vote. And the first thing the government did was throw him in jail because he had the audacity to challenge the president. Um, but he really got sort of the middle class galvanized behind a political movement, which no one had done for years. So those kind of people, um, you know, you don't, they don't need a direct um, endorsement, but any kind of repression against them, you have to speak out um, uh, against it. And I think, you know, President Obama made some steps in that direction with his speech in Cairo. He talked about, you know, the United States needed to listen more, needed to promote the, the, the interests of ordinary people, and it needed to set up sort of a scholarship program in the region. And, you know, aid is often sort of Aid has a terrible reputation in the United States, and you asked, there was a poll taken earlier this year, and 65% of Americans said, we just give too much foreign aid. But when you actually break down the numbers, the United States does give more aid than any other country. It's $22 billion. But um, the, the United Nations um, has a standard for what constitutes real generosity, and they say that real generosity is for every $100 your economy generates, you should give away 70 cents. And for every hundred dollars that the United States gives, um, it generates, they give away 18 cents. So it's a very low number. Not very many countries, it has to be said, reach that 70 cent mark. There's like five countries in Northern Europe, basically, the Dutch and the Scandinavian countries do reach it. Um, but you know, aid has to be done. And you know, sometimes I'm asked. Um, you know, do, the, do, the, do Arabs want freedom? Do, do Iranians want freedom? Um, you know, as if somehow, um, you know, by culture, religion, education, tradition, genetics, somehow that they're just not interested in it. And, you know, I, I posed that question to Samir, and this is the last point I'll make. Um, Samir, the poet in Jordan, I said, you know, do Arabs want to live in democratic systems? Or, you know, are they genetically somehow, or are they disposed not to? And he said, you know, just think of it like automobiles. Like, everyone in the world drives cars, but if you came to the Arab world, everybody would be riding a donkey. And the government would tell you, this is our tradition. We like donkeys. And you have to know that that is a lie. We want to be like everyone else. We want to be normal. And I think that that is the move that needs to be supported throughout the Middle East. Thank you very much. <laughs>
guess two, two parts uh, to the question. One thing is, I wonder if you said a little bit about sort of the relationship between the, the assumption that we often have that democracy and secularism will go hand in hand. And, you know, I, one thinks of the example of the elections in Palestine. <coughs> you know, once the Palestinians had actually democratically elected the Hamas, uh, you know, they had to pay for it dearly, and that was not recognized by the United States, and even though supposedly the, the elections were supported. So, you know, what, how can you know, what are your thoughts about this? How to get sort of um, around this assumption that democracy inherently is somehow implies secularism? Um, and the, the second thing that I was just wondering about your the title of the talk refers to Lebanon, obviously, but you didn't say anything about Lebanon in any of your points. And it seems that some of the sort of generalizations you've made, you're saying in most of the Middle East, and I had to think in many other cases that Lebanon poses kind of an interesting uh, exception in some of the ways that the democracy works there. I, I, I didn't, you know, Lebanon was not one of the six countries that I, I'm going to take your second question first and then I'll get back to the other one. Um, it wasn't one of the six countries that I concentrated on because they do, they do have, you know, the inst most of the institutions that um, the others lack in terms of, you know, civil society. And um, the, um, the, um, the book is sort of divided into two halves, as it were. In one half, I talk about the, that gap between perception and reality, and that's where it comes in because um, the book, the title, comes from a, a, an email that I received. You know, when you work in Hezbollah territory in the south of Beirut or in the southern suburb, you have to fill out like four pages or five pages of paperwork. Um, you know, where you went to college, who your mother is, etc. And then one of the things they ask you is your birthday. And then on my next birthday, you know, I opened my email and there was a happy birthday message from Hezbollah at Hezbollah.org. Um, and so it's just sort of like how our perception of how the organization works and the reality are not always the same. Um, but um, you know, I also think that the Lebanese political system is sort of stuck in a similar way in that you know the, the, there has been a little bit of change in terms of the feudal families that control it, but those feudal dynasties like the you know, Hariri's, you know, would Saad Hariri in any other country be the, the prime minister? It's unlikely. Um, and you know, they have the same dynastic problem in that people don't want to relinquish power to the most capable. Um, and um, I think that in terms of you know, your point with Hamas is, 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 is well taken. And then you know, that's sort of where the US policy started to fall apart because you know, they said you know, we're not, we're, we've sacrificed, um, um, we've pursued stability and sacrificed democracy and achieved neither. And then the first example was Hamas. And they're like, oh my god, you know, who's winning these elections? And you know, that is the problem is that the only alternative, and certainly the reason that, that most Gazans voted in Hamas, I mean, there are a certain percentage of them that you know, support their idea of religious principles, but most of them um, voted in because they think Fatah is a corrupt um, organization and they, that has done nothing for them and they want to be rid of it. Um, and if there was another alternative, they might vote for them. And um, you know, uh, there's been a, several attempts at, to do it. I mean, the Jordanians have this big study about how you, you know, foster other political parties, and they decided that you know you do it the same way you foster seats for women, is that you set aside a certain number of seats for you know other parties, and you allow them to grow. Because you know, certainly people like Samir, the poet that I I talked to, he was not interested in a religious party. He wanted a secular party, but there wasn't really an alternative there. You know, he said. There's a Ba'athist party. Why is there still a Ba'athist party after we've seen what, what Ba'athism does? Um, and so the, the solution that this committee came up with is in Jordan is that you, know, you help foster other parties by reserving a certain number of seats until they can stand on their own, own feet. And you make religious parties you know, sort of agree, you, know, the, you hinge their participation in, um, in, in guaranteeing that they're not going to be you know, one you know, one man, one vote, one time, that, that they accept the political process and that they sort of don't believe in, in weapons or coercion as a way of running the government. And they didn't get a chance to try it because, you know, King Abdullah was having none of it and he just sort of shelved the plan and said thank you very much and, and, and made no attempt to implement it. Um, but, you know, there are people that are trying to find, find ways around that. The rise of multiple media organizations hasn't necessarily been a good thing for news in the Arab world. Uh, just like in the United States, you have like such a saturation of news all over the place that inevitably like political views come out. I was wondering uh, if you would comment on that, if you think that's the case, because he says that when it was just Al Jazeera, the news was a lot better 
and people were getting a lot more informed, and you did see some progress in terms of uh, change coming to the Middle East. And now that there is a saturation of the news, um, I guess the news industry, that's, uh, that's kind of tailing off now. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, he, Professor Lynch does a great job in, in sort of paying attention to the, um, the Arab media on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, I mean, Al Jazeera definitely had problems in, the, in that its news was excellent. It was just really on the ball and, and fast. But its talk shows were often, you know, politically oriented from the beginning. Um, and, um, you know, it did give people sort of a false hope that this was going to, to change things. And it, it, it's just not enough. I mean, they, most of the governments just shuttered it. And um, uh, and then they set up alternatives. But it, it's interesting because it still has a certain amount of power because um, a, a, a bunch of Arab you know, communications mis ministers, which is another sort of set of fossils left over from the Soviet system, got together in Cairo and they tried to promulgate rules for the quote unquote 400 satellite channels in the Arab world. And all the rules when you read through them were basically how to shut down and shut up Al Jazeera. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was all about you can't insult the country, you can't report this, you can't report that. Um, but um, you know, it, 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 it's it's just. I mean, I think even if it, if there was only Al Jazeera, um, the problem to an extent is that just electronic, you know, media. Even in this country, we see the same things. You, you know, people, you know. <clears throat> make strong political statements on the TV, and you know they're, 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 it sort of raises the collective um, blood pressure in the country. But when it comes down to making policy, it's the politicians and the people on the ground that do it. So um, it helped freedom of speech, and it, it certainly the Al Jazeera trickled down to newspapers. The newspapers in Cairo, um, there's a couple of newspapers that are much freer and report on much more information than they ever were able to before, and it's because Al Jazeera kind of pushed open on, on that door. So I think, all, you know, we also expect change to come too fast. So I, I think they laid the groundwork for it, but there is no substitute for just political organizing on the ground and getting new parties in place and, and, and new politicians, which they haven't had in any of those countries for a very long time. I have a <clears throat> perception that the Arab story is very little heard in the United States. Uh, it, I just wanted to know if, if you think that's the case. For example, um, I was uh, reading in the London Review of, of Books, there's this long article about why they believe the Lockerbie uh, bombers had nothing to do with Libya. And this is the first, I just assumed that the guy was guilty, and this is the first I had heard that there was any question. Uh, and, and if he wasn't guilty, then you would think, and the same thing for the... Uh, the Israeli-Palestine problem. Is, is the Arab story under told by our media in the United States? Um, you know, I think it is. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I sort of felt like that aspect of the Arab world is undercovered. Um, but it's a little bit of, it is a problem of um, attitudes, and a little bit of it is a problem of resources. And um, I was just saying this earlier to, to, to some of the, I was talking to some high school teachers before I came in here, and it used to be that there were about nine or ten American newspaper correspondents in the region. Um, and, you know, when there's a violence going on of, uh, um, involving the American military, the idea that people are going to be covering, you know, resources are going to be thrown at other stories is a little bit unrealistic. And that's that's part of the problem is that, you know, once the, American military went on the ground in Iraq, that became the, the overwhelming story. But it's also just, you know, newspapers have had to, to pull back. Um, and I would fight this all the time. You know, I mean, when I was, I was working in Egypt on a story on aid, like how is U.S. aid perceived? And I had been working on it for months, and I tried to find doctors in a, in a clinic um, that received American support to run their clinics, but didn't necessarily agree with American values. Um, and I was working on various, um, there was also a big judicial reform effort that was kind of derailing because the lawyers got wind of the fact that the American government was underwriting it, and so they didn't want to take part. Anyway, it was kind of a theme. And I've been working on it for months. And then, um, you know, Al-Qaeda blew up a tanker off the coast of Yemen. And, you know, my editors called me up and said, you got to go to that. And, you know, I argued and I lost. And I, I can't say that they were wrong, um, you know, because when someone's blowing up oil tankers on the high seas, you want to know about it. And um, so it's a little bit, <coughs> you know, we're all, as reporters, um, 
you know, you, you only have so many hours in the day, and when there's a huge overwhelming story like that, it just sort of, it, it, it sucks up a lot of the oxygen, unfortunately. I hey. have a question, I'm um, referring back to your comment about the woman who organized on Facebook. Uh -huh. And I know people that I hang out with are just really excited about social media and Twitter uh -huh. and Facebook and how it's a game changer, it's going to change everything. I don't care what industry you're in. <laughs> how much do you think online communities are going to help people in the Middle East? I don't know if there's any blocking and stuff like that of certain sites in the, certain countries, but just wondering if whether it's communicating with people outside the country or within their own country organizing, if you think it's actually going to have any effect at all. Um, I think that, you know, it, 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 it works in some, I mean, it is blocked in some cases, you know, the Syrians block it all the time and they say that, you know, the Israelis will try and recruit spies via Facebook so they have to shut it down. Um, and, um, it allows for a public square that doesn't exist. Like that woman in Egypt would have never found a way to communicate, you know, um, to 76,000 people if it, Facebook didn't exist. I mean, for years there was a movement called Enough in Egypt. Um, and it, the, the Kafaya, it was a political movement. It's like, we've had enough of the system. And it was mostly, you know, journalists and lawyers. And they would have a, a weekly protest on the... Um, the steps of the journalists and lawyers, um, I mean, on the journalist syndicate. And, you know, the riot police would be out in quadruple roles, you know, around them because they knew that if they got out into the streets of Cairo, they would get millions in an instant. And so they kept them very hedged in. And so, you know, F Facebook allows you to sort of vault over those lines of policemen and communicate to others in the country, and you can kind of share ideas. But ultimately, you know, you have to change the system, you know, with laws, and, you know, you change the laws um, through the parliament or however you do it, and so it's an imperfect um, system because you can't, they don't translate automatically into feet on the ground on the streets protesting, like, you know, people can make all the noise they want on the internet, it doesn't make much difference. If there's two million people protesting in downtown Cairo and they bring traffic to a halt, the government has to address it. Um, and that is, you know, the weakness to a certain extent in that it allows people, you know, to understand that there's others out there with a common interest, but it doesn't give them the tool they need to, to, to affect change. Yes, you seem to have present, you have presented two images of Egypt, it seems to me. Uh, one of, you have an aged ruler and the possibility of a dynasty, perhaps Mubarak's son will rule after him. Uh, you've mentioned instances of repression in Egypt, but there's also been a history of you know, lively protest, you know, going all the way back to 1919. Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been reviled and imprisoned, uh, now is operating within the, the, the political mainstream, and some would even consider it a, a kind of an opposition party. So it, it's gained wider acceptance and toleration from the government. So we know that Mubarak isn't, doesn't have many years left. I'm wondering if you could look into the future, and, and do you have any cause for optimism about the possibility for a real change in Egypt? We, we don't know that Mubarak isn't going to live together ever, because you ask a Cairo cab driver how long he's been, why he's been there for so long, and he said, <clears throat> at night he sneaks into the Egyptian museum and he squeezes the mummies and he drinks the juice from the mummies, and that's why he's going to live forever. <laughs> um, but... Um, it is, you know, it's true that they've had one system there more or less since Nasser took power, and um, it's it's an open question what comes next because um, Mubarak has been sort of grooming his son, um, but we don't really know if um, he's going to succeed because everybody thinks that if he really wants to put his son in power, he's going to have to do it while he's still alive. Um, and um, he doesn't want to do that because he thinks, you know, he's the man to, to rule Egypt. And there's sort of a sense that it's his wife that's pushing his son. Um, now, whether he could, um, you know, whether Gamal, the son, could, could win on his own, you know, because he obviously has huge name recognition. And again, the wisdom of taxi drivers, which I don't write about, but I always try. And you know, they say, well, he might be a good president because his father's had, you know, 30 years to rip off the country so they've stolen all the money they need and maybe he'll be a good ruler. Um, but I think that the answer to that is that, you know, Egypt, Egypt, Egyptians themselves don't know. You know, you ask some of them and they said, you know, in the 1940s before Nasser came in, we had a vibrant political system. You know, we had all parties across the spectrum. We basically have, you know, the, the, the people who were in their 20s then are in their 80s now and they're running the same parties and what we just need is, is fresh blood. And, you know, I have... Uh, 
a filmmaker friend named Atiyat Abnudi, and she said, you know, we've had a civilization here for 5,000 years, and Egypt has worked best when there's one guy sitting, you know, where the, the Nile forks, and he runs the whole country. And no matter how much you support democracy, and no matter how much you support change, that is, you know, the model that works in Egypt. And she, you know, works in an NGO that's, that's trying to change laws and, and change things. And I think basically what people expect to happen is that when, you know, the military is the unknown quantity because they've run the country more or less um, since 1952. So when Mubarak dies, is the military going to get together and decide like they always had that one of them is... Um, you know, going to be the next ruler, or are they going to get together and say, okay, we're going to have elections and, you know, and throw it open? And, you know, if they do, obviously that will create a sea change there. And since Egypt was sort of the model for everybody else in the region, that would have, have an enormous influence. But, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to know that until the day Mubarak dies or soon thereafter. Um, I wanted to ask you a question uh, relating to your experience in the Middle East as a journalist. You had mm -hmm. mentioned earlier um, arguing with your editors about going to certain assignments, things like that. Um, so occasionally when I read, even in the New York Times, uh, things about the Middle East, I feel that uh, the essence of the truth is there, but it may have been tweaked or filtered to, an to the degree that it would be acceptable to its core readership. Uh, did you have similar struggle struggles with your editors on you know, the, the events that you were reporting, because I listened to you tonight, and I'm, you know, on your way, like, and seeing somebody who knows the big picture, as you mentioned earlier in, you, in your book, you reflect, you address, you know, the, the life of the people there, but did you have similar experiences in the actual uh, journalism itself? I, you know, I know that there's a history that that's occasionally happened in the past of the New York Times, that editors try and sort of manipulate the direction of, of, of a story. I personally did not experience it. Um, you know, there were arguments about what priority and where to go and things like that, but they pretty much felt that, you know, I grew up in the region, I spoke the language, um, you know, I had a better command of the area than they did, and so I could set my own agenda. Um, and by and large, that's how it worked. And even the editing process, you know, I never felt one of my stories was changed to reflect, you know, I mean, you always want more space, right? You always feel aggrieved <laughs> that you didn't get enough inches in the paper. But um, I never really felt like they had interfered in any way to change the tone of, of, of what I was writing. Or, um, And I think, I, you know, I honestly think... Um, Somebody was asking me this earlier today about whether the New York Times was pushing the war in Afghanistan, and I'm always sort of taken aback by that because I don't think of the New York Times as a collective organization because um, I just see how the reporters work, and we're all kind of, we're not free agents, obviously, but we're very independent agents, and everybody kind of decides for themselves, yes, you need editors, but they give you an enormous amount of leeway to write what you want. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess the bottom line is is that I, I, I never felt unfairly treated the whole time I was, I, was, I was working for them in the region, and I really felt like I got to write, you know, what I want within, you know, did I not want to go cover the 16th bombing in a row in Saudi Arabia? Yes, I would have preferred to do something else, but there was a bombing and there was violence, and, you know, I, 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 I had to go do that, obviously. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were given kind of leeway because you knew the language and you grew up there. Um, is this usually, in terms of language, is this usually the case for reporters that go into the Middle East? And um, if not, what kind of barriers exist for people who um, don't speak Arabic or don't understand it? Yeah, it, 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 it's one of the regions. It's funny, um, you know, if you go to China or Russia, um, Japan, to a certain extent, on assignment, they they take a year and um, teach the correspondence intensively, the language, because the feeling is you can't really operate without it. But one of the ironies of the Middle East is that the people that run those countries are generally, or at least sort of the ministerial level, are so well educated that they all speak English. And they're sort of, because of the colonial history, there's English language newspapers, and you can kind of get by. Um, and then there's also an enormous number of, you know, educated people. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the, in, the, in the dedication to, to my book that in every country, I mean, I had 23 countries, right? So I could not be on top of everything in every country all the time because I had to pay attention to what I was working on at that moment. Um, but I had a sort of core group of 10 people around the region, and when something erupted suddenly in Yemen or... Um, you know, in Jordan, there was a person that I could work for me who I could call up and say, what's going on? And, and, and they would feed to me. So, you know, there is a system of sort of fixers and locals 
um, who have their ears, eyes and ears open, um, who sort of are uh, the, um, you know, the interpreters um, for a lot of the news that you see. And, you know, your news coverage is often only as good, you know, as your fixtures. Now, I could get around that because I, you know, I'd have the TV on and I could, you know, I'd see stuff. And so I was more alert to it. Um, but people who don't speak the language are, are basically, um, you know, dependent to a certain extent on, you know, the quality of the, the people that are working around them. Now, there's other sources, of course. You know, there's embassies. There's, you know, all kinds of, you know, opposition figures, human rights organizations that, that help you out. Um, but ultimately, it's, like it's the people, that, you know, working immediately in your office that, that are the most helpful and the most sort of have the most influence on what you end up writing. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.